You're embedded, I baby. With Doyle. Doyle. <laughs> What do you uh, do with shedding, the hair? She's, she's <laughs> shedding everywhere, man. I got to groom her when I can. Oh, from Brooklyn, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental. I'm Andrew Weeby with my partners in soccer, David Goss, Kaylin Carr, Woodgrain, Kaylin Carr, I should say. <laughs> Fire up YouTube if you want to understand that reference. And Matt Doyle, what's up, guys? How you doing? It's our uh, twice a week check in. Caitlin, we haven't talked to you in a while. You feeling good? You feeling okay? Yeah, man. Everything is good. I've been hanging out on uh, pretty much every little random stream that's going on these days in MLS. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I jumped on last night when you were doing the quiz with Charlie and uh, Goss, was helping out with Sasha Kleshton, giving some feeding yeah. him some answers. Fafa uh, Pico was in there. Marisa Du was in there roasting him. Extra time trivia night on Instagram Live. Yeah. Did you, like I, the, did you like the questions? You think it was fun? No, it's great. I want to do one. I, how, how do I get on that show? I'm on every other show. I just yeah, haven't been on that You're not on enough shows? <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. I, that one is fun. And plus, it Charlie fun. just taken it to the next level and just like opened up a nice like vintage Cabernet. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know if I have the same quality wine collection, but I like that that sort of element to it. I, think I was drinking, doing, I was drinking like drink. a 15 bottle, dollar bottle out of a coffee mug. And mm. I agree. You know, Charlie was bringing like, uh, oh yeah, in 1982, left yeah. side of the bank. Yep. Like had a fancy glass. Absolutely. So, felt comfortable. You know, I, I picked this up in Sochaux. Yeah. Uh, back yeah. In my days in <laughs> I've been saving it for a special occasion, an extra time trivia night. Was that occasion? By the way, we tweeted all those questions in a thread with hints, with the answers at the end. So go to at extra time on Twitter if you want to play along, see how you did. It goes from easy to Dima Kovalenko, which is incredibly hard. And nobody got that one except for one guy in the comments section. We have a big show for you today. We're doing more Mount Rushmore's Orlando City. Eh, little, it's difficult, let's say. And FC Dallas and Reggie Cannon will join us for that. Uh, we'll also have Fred Lipka on the show. Uh, you might know Fred um, from all the kind of discussions around youth development. He is the technical director of player youth and development uh, in our player personnel department at Major League Soccer. So he's going to explain what's going on, at least from the MLS perspective, with the Developmental Academy, because it is no more U.S. soccer pulled out on that one. And I read in Soccer America, and this explains a lot, that it was a $12 million a year deal for U.S. soccer. Right now, they obviously can't play any games, men or women or youth. Uh, and the Federation seems to be kind of shuffling the deck as far as executives as well. So uh, we'll get more from Fred on that one. We'll talk to Reggie Cannon here in just a little bit. But there is some news on the MLS front. Commissioner Don Garber did a media tour, uh, and he was talking about what's going to happen with these games. He says still, quote, focused on getting as many games in as possible in 2020. But he also said that the league is exploring alternatives. Here's the quote. From tournament formats and neutral locations, ultimately playing an abridged regular season, but doing everything we can to get games, he said. He also said when and if play does resume, games would mostly be played behind closed doors in what uh, Commissioner Don Garber dubbed, quote, MLS studio games. I'm not sure what that means, but it seems pretty clear based on what uh, Commissioner Garber has said and just the obvious that's staring in all of our faces that these games are going to be delayed when they are played further into the winter uh, we'll see what happens here. We don't know what's going to happen. Studio games sounds like maybe more streams for Kalen to jump on. You know, just <laughs> just showing thinking. up in the middle of a Cascadia Cup match. Whatever. Oh, it's Kalen's here. Dude, I would take any type of game you can give me right now. Like, <laughs> whatever you got, like I'm, I'm in for it. So. No joke. On this show last week, like the last five minutes of the show, there was a, a guy on the corner with like a – he had a, a trash bag full of, of – uh, of empty cans and it broke. So he was walking around like trying to kick the cans back into one pile. I like five, 10 minutes. It was, it was like the, the best I felt since early March. Guys. Dude, I was watching two squirrels outside my window the other day. Just like, just, I don't know. They were just walking around and mm -hmm. hanging out on a ledge. And I was like, this is, I'm going to just go into their world. It was like, I've seen everything on Netflix now. So that's all I have left. It's a little different here. Here, we're going for walks when we can and staying away from people and just looking for backhoes. If I find a backhoe, I feel like I just scored a banger in the World Cup, man. The crowd that I got going crazy, Cameron <laughs> doing chants, backhoe, 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 more dad, more dad. I mean, you got to find enjoyment wherever you can. I think we have some mail, though, Dave. 401 mls extra time at MLSsoccer.com. I've been seeing these trickle through, and this is a good opportunity to kind of bring them out. Some potentially alternative formats, I think. 
yeah, for fans of what you would want to see or would do when MLS comes back and how it gets structured, of course, in the timeline we have. First one from Connor Ennis, who says, longtime listener, hope everyone's safe. Same to you, Connor. He said, when you think about it, you look at past strikes in American sports like the NFL, NHL, and you look at what leagues do around the world. He says, you take the two games that everyone's already played and you play every other team across both conferences one time, whether it's home or away. You play every single team. Then you go into a single elimination, top 16 teams, bracket style to break it down for an MLS champion. So you have like a 25 that. game regular season. I Wait, actually, you know, like tw- yeah, okay. I, I like that. So you're only taking nine games off. That's logistically feels difficult seeing that it's April 16th. We only have two games. But I, I definitely like the idea of like compressing it one game against everybody, whether it's in conference or both conferences, and then just make the playoffs like as, as NCAA tournament as you can, which we were closing in on with the new format change last year. But bringing out the 16 teams, I mean, that seems fair to me. Yeah, that's a good one. So here's another tournament style structure. Uh, also, Connor sent us his Minnesota Mount Rushmore, so we'll we'll bank that for later. Kevin from Milwaukee says, thinking about ways to play, how do you step in? Sort of like what we were talking about with the DA, and we'll hear more about from Fred. How does MLS step in and add to the game? You set up a structure where you've got every MLS team, every USL Championship, USL League One, NISA, and Canadian Premier League team, along with the Canadian MLS teams, and you make one tournament out of all of them where you put them into local groups and then the winners of the groups move into a single elimination knockout so he also sent us all of the groups it's a through the the pools are let me just get this up again pools are a through p brad purcell need an intern that's what it sounds like here so anyone want to give me a letter a through p b is seattle portland new mexico united real monarchs and cavalry fc I don't Boy, know we really pulled New teams. Mexico up north, huh? They're going to have yeah, to do yeah, some right. traveling on this one. Also, I also appreciate the fact that we're so far past any like realm of reality that Taquito or General Sau or whichever one that is is just getting combed yeah. in the middle of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Just She's double time. Just I would, I would like the over under was the, on this was week four of when <laughs> Doyle would just immediately we hit the over. Yeah, we I think we hit the over. over. You held out, man. Good, good stuff. What I'm you? actually surprised she doesn't have her own show yet because, again, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see this cat has star power. Look at that. Oh, my God. <laughs> has eating power. That's yeah, for sure. Yeah, hey, it's like a, the she's bulldog a, of cats. She's a very healthy girl. You guys, I just want you to know I love the idea of Group N over here, which is the classic rivalry NYCFC versus New York Red Bulls and Loudoun United against Athletic Ottawa. That's the dream, man. That's what we're waiting for. Just bring them all together. This is what I stay up late at night thinking about. It's amazing. So so I like the tournament idea. um, And like, if, if, you know, if it gets to like, oh, we can't start the season until September, it'll probably have to be something like that. Um, But I think he's aiming at the wrong leagues. I think the way to do it is Liga MX. So you get the 26 MLS teams and you get the 18 Liga MX teams. So you have 44 teams, you do 11 groups of four, you play a round robin like Champions League does in Europe. Um, you play a round robin, so that's six games. The top two finishers and the 10 best um, third place finishers all then go into a 32 team single elimination bracket. Like that, so it's six games at least for each team, and then 32, 16, 8, and as five more so no team would end up playing more than 11 games which is probably what it would need to be if we're pushing the start back way late in the year and it's also look it's it's mls and liga mx we know there's more of this coming um and we know that the draw could be a gigantic production is like oh club america and atlanta or seattle in the same pot you know how does that work out like you know the sponsors would be in on that. I think it would draw a lot of eye, eyeballs here and down there. Um, and look, they're they're in similar dire straits in terms of what they're going to do with their leagues. I'll put my hand up for that one. That sounds Easy, awesome. Easier to play in Mexico in the winter. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Like we we don't know, Jack. That's what we do know <laughs> at this point. Like what's going to happen, when it's going to happen. Just like you at home, we're just waiting for uh, the powers that be, both first from the government side and the medical side to get us to a point where this might even be possible and then from the leagues as well. So uh, if you have any alternative formats, 
let us know. Hit us up. Uh, until then, we're all waiting for soccer. Waiting for some normalcy to come back. Uh, do you guys want to, Dave, you want to guide us through what's happening with the Developmental Academy stuff before we talk to Fred Lipka? I mean, my understanding, like I said, I, I, was, I read Soccer America every morning, and at the bottom of their story about what happened, it said, this saves U.S. soccer $12 million a year. That seems to be a pretty big giveaway as to what happened. U.S. soccer decided the expense they couldn't do, and it all feels like a surprise. I mean, you go on soccer Twitter right now, and people were shocked. People have a lot of opinions. Uh, what are you guys taking away from it? Dave, I know you're the GA Cup expert in here. You're embedded, I baby. With Doyle. Doyle. <laughs> what do you uh, do with the it. hair? She's, she's shedding everywhere, man. I got to groom her when I can. Oh, my God. So the GA Cup, by the way, is MLS's competition. It's separate, separate qualifying. Uh, the DA is what MLS teams play in, along with the top clubs around America in their league play throughout the year. Um, and there's a DA championship as well. It normally happens in LA, U.S. soccer streams it often as well. So it's a lot of the big teams you guys, you know, we all hear about. Uh, the ones Kalen grew up playing against, the one Weeby could never play against and I could never Ouch. play against. From all the regions. Um, Dude, I was, playing, and- I was playing against old Greek guys in Berkeley. I was, at the, <laughs> I was like far away from any sort of organized structure. You didn't play Pagliadores? No, no way. Actually, I did in high school. Uh, we went down and played Patty Adores and Irvine Strikers. I think that's how I got seen to go to college, probably, because I beat a bunch of the hey, Berkeley guys. Yeah. Benny Failhaber, Chris Pontius, Irvine Striker alumni. Those are the those were some squads. Those were some squads. But yeah, so DA is the general league. U.S. soccer operated it. And U.S. soccer, obviously, because of that money and because of what's going on, we don't know when it's going to come back. They stepped out. It seems like there was a void. There's a lot of question marks about what happened? What could it mean? Did MLS teams pull out first? Did U.S. soccer pull out first? It sounds like it's on U.S. soccer's side. But this was the structure that U.S. soccer created to try and get more competitive games. So to pull kids out of playing 45 games a year against anyone in the area, plus high school soccer, to less games, more competitive, higher level, a little bit more travel for those top teams. Four times training per week. That was the yeah. big one as well. So all of that was part of this structure, and it's worked to some extent. Some people would argue it hadn't worked. They started it on the women's side as well, but now they're stepping out, and I guess we'll talk to Fred about what comes next. Before we get to Fred, Doyle, you have any uh, final thoughts on this as you've kind of come to terms? I know you you think about this space more than maybe most. Yeah, I, I think that people who said that the, the USSDA didn't work um, are, are fooling themselves because I remember what came first and how, uh, how scattershot it was. Um, it definitely showed a lot of promise. The best players in the youth national team set up uh, for many, many cycles now, um, including guys who are playing in the biggest clubs in the world, all came through the USSDA. That said, we all knew it was going to change at some point. Um, Why is U.S. soccer giving technical guidance to MLS teams? MLS teams and independent academy teams uh, throughout the country – should sort of have that should should have that mandate themselves. So I, I understand why U.S. soccer got out of it. It seems weird that they did it like that, but I guess we're in weird times. Um, I do think this is an opportunity to take the USSD, USSDA structure and make something bigger. Um, and I assume, you know, let, let's hear what Fred has to say. All right, let's turn now to Fred Lipka. He's the technical director of player youth and development at Major League Soccer. Uh, Fred, welcome to Extra Time. Glad to have you, man. Uh, thank you, guys. It's a pleasure to be to be present and uh, always good to to see you on the field and sometimes also uh, digitally now, huh? Me in, in the air. Me on having the air. Fred on right now is great because normally we'd be at GA Cup right now, smelling that Frisco, Texas air eating beautiful dinners together so i've missed that so i'm glad we could have fred on so i feel a little bit of that love ah, it's, it's a beautiful are, thing you are our first supporter and we we are we are we have a lot of chance to to have you uh, uh with us so let's talk youth development we just got done fred kind of going through what happened with the developmental academy and the decision made by u.s soccer and what mls has decided to do can you just walk me through the why from MLS's side, I mean, DA goes away and MLS steps in to fill the void immediately. There's some confusion, some surprise from a lot of different parties, but why from MLS stepping in like this? So, uh, yes, uh, the why is interesting because uh, 
we announced yesterday a, a very important uh, decision and uh, a new a new platform for elite players in this country and more and beyond but yesterday was us soccer announcement but we heard and we were we are not completely uh, 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 stupid and uh, the rumors were in the air for for several weeks and sometimes also we had the certitude uh, i would say uh, uh, several uh, days before the announcement so we were prepared to reply that's why we 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 we, we stepped in very quickly because we didn't want to let a kind of chaos uh, 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 situation uh, with our clubs first and uh, uh, with the other clubs and i'm going to go back on the decision it's uh, it was totally surprised we, we were surprising by the decision and by because it's, it's it wasn't the plan and uh, the covid crisis uh, uh, i would say uh, um uh, uh, was the reason why U.S. soccer made the decision? So we needed to address a very a very clear message about for our clubs, for our clubs on behalf of our club and for our players, for the family. First, we have a lot of players in our pipeline, good kids, good potential, with uh, which uh, dream about soccer, which dream about the game, and which want to become professional. Or if they don't want to become professional, they will they will they will want to to integrate a good uh, a college program. So we have the the responsibility to to say very quickly, we are here, we won't let you down. We are going to 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 to, to keep up a, a, a good competition platform, and you can stay. And if you are a player outside of MLS. We will have. We will provide the platform for you to try to fulfill your dream and to optimize and to play and to optimize your potential. The second aspect was for the community. So uh, the DA clubs, non MLS, uh, uh, could have been in trouble if they don't have a kind of pr platform to play and to have such level of play like like they had in the in the past. So we wanted also to address a, a message of. Uh, solidarity uh, uh, and I said uh, and, and I'm think about uh, 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 in a different way because I am not American but I said internally guys it's a patriot act we have to step in because also the other club will need some f something maybe uh, 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 to play uh, into and we can also guarantee this quality this project long-term project to for the sake of not only MLS very selfishly, but for 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 the other club, uh, that's that was the, the why. So uh, I know there is a lot of discussion uh, in in the country. What I can say to every single non MLS club which play in the DA, you will have a place to to play when we could play because we don't know exactly when it will be, and uh, MLS. Uh, will help the community and will support the community and first and foremost the kids uh, 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 in this country to play at the good level of soccer so you mentioned this kind of caught you by surprise this announcement and you wanted to react quickly but you didn't have time to come out with a full plan with the discussions going on and the expectations what do you think this will be what do you think this competition or this structure will look like going forward Gus, I can't tell you today, but the, the, the DA program was for 19, U17, U15, U14, U13. So we are basically five, uh, uh, five um, uh, uh, categories. So we will make sure for all the kids there is a, 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 a competition with a good level of play. That's, I, I, I can tell you that. I can tell you something else. We are a professional league. I think the level of quality of what we can deliver at the first team level, and I, I, I think about the game, but everything around the game in terms of best practices, I would say, uh, uh, a communication. We cannot do something wrong. We cannot do something not qualitative because MLS is committed to provide something with the good standards and i would say i hope high standards in terms of environment but also in terms of communication and everything to 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 we, we could be proud of 
This is my re reply. So we have two, two, two uh, 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 I would say, two demands. It's first to, to deliver a programming for every single club, okay, which were in the DA and further we will see, and also to provide something qualitative. Talk to me a little about, you've been here a few years now, you know where you want to go, you know what your plan is for improving the quality of players coming into Major League Soccer, young players. How does this now fit into it? And what's your ideas of what you're looking for over the next 12 to 18 months? I see it like a, an opportunity also to try to have, to try to, to connect the head and the body, the head of the pyramid with the, with the body. We, I think uh, we, we, we arrive uh, MLS uh, after everyone. We, we have, uh, we have been created, uh, we created our, our academy in 2007. So everyone in the landscape uh, uh, saw us arrive and say, Oh, they are the new kid on the, uh, you can run the blocks, uh, as, as you say, and it was a kind of surprising. I think now with a lot of effort, investment uh, in coaching education, in quality, and we 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 we, we, to, we have to be also humble and honest. We 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 are doing. Uh, we've been doing a good a, a good job for maybe the last four or five years, and I think people can see that now. So we we want to be this this cap cap We want to have the capacity to 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 influence and to. To be uh, aspirational for all kids and coaches and parents, we also hope we could uh, have a, a good relationship with with the other club because at the end of the day, what uh, what brings this, this uh, opportunity is also a, 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 a momentum to make it clear what are the objective. The objective of MLS club are for sure to develop to to, to develop kids for their academy for their first team uh, uh, after they for sure. It won't be the case for all of them. So, and we are here to 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 make sure and to guarantee they could have access to the best uh, college program or something else, another professional league. But we want to to to. I think it's able to find a compromise. All the non non DA team in uh, uh, in in um, uh, ex uh, except MLS are not here to develop, ex especially professional kids. So I think we can have a, a kind of symbiotic approach to say. We are going to help the kids which want to become professional, and we are going to also uh, support the club, which uh, uh, the mission, which is not ultimately to develop professional, but good level of play and to be a kind of good uh, environment to to fulfill every kid's dream. This is the objective at the end. I think the, the traction we had in the past where the following... We need better competition and better, I would say, international and national domestic competition to challenge our coaches, staff, and players. And uh, we, we had a kind of uh, unbalance in terms of ratio of games. We want to, to, to increase the level of play for some players and for some teams, but we are also need to compete and to, in, to be inclusive and not to be exclusive. This is the message. So sometimes... It's easier to be in agreement when we have two people than three. So it was a kind of misunderstanding. Unity. That's what they're preaching. Also, there's still the unknown, Fred. I'm sure that everybody's trying to figure this out just like we are. A surprise from U.S. Soccer, MLS stepping in. We thank you for your time. I'm sure we'll be following up on this very, very soon as more details come out. But for now, Fred Lipka. Technical Director for uh, the youth side here at Major League Soccer. Thank you for your time, Fred. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right, big thanks to Fred for taking time out of his busy day to uh, help walk us through sort of the MLS perspective on that. Let us know what you think. 401 mls Extra time at MLSsoccer.com. Ultimately, we want to produce as many players as we can, whether it's professional, college, whatever, and give kids the opportunity to achieve their dreams. Let's talk about some people who have achieved those dreams. Mount Rushmore time, baby. Wait, let me just jump in real quick. Yeah, after the after that discussion you had with him, David, where do you like how do you feel? Do you feel better? Do you feel like there's some clarity? Yeah, definitely. I think I think the big question mark was why, which he explained mm -hmm. and we talked a little bit about before, but we learned from him of what happened and the idea was just MLS is trying to step in and be supportive of the soccer community, which I think is huge. I think it's big that independent club Major League Soccer is not big enough to cover every youth player in America right. and Canada. So it's right. you need to have a good faith relationship. 
And I think that's what Fred came on our show to stress. And that's the idea behind it. But the other thing he said, and it's, I work this generation Adidas Cup, so obviously I like it, but, uh, but the reason it was created was international competition has value. And they believe mm-hmm. that that was one of the big things to get players to the next level. And Fred mentioned this ratio. And we, we talked about it before he came on. 50 games a year plus high school soccer and no trainings and no international competition. And you're starting to move. And part of what this allows is MLS teams probably to move a little bit closer to an ideal scenario. And I know if you're interested, you can go down and look at Atlanta United. They have a U17 group that they bring around the world basically every two and a half months to play teams in England, to play teams in Colombia, U23 teams in Japan, uh, reserve teams in Mexico to try and get that competition. And I think this, it wasn't planned, but I think the reality of this is you can use this opportunity, as Fred said, to lay this out and think and improve what you're doing for MLS teams, as well as maintaining what you're doing for everyone else. Good. Richie right, Cannon played in the GD Cup. Yeah. No, it's all good. That was good no, stuff. Good. I was I was enthralled. <laughs> I was stuck in on that. You can listen to Gas Man talk all day. I know. If we want to talk to Jacob and we're bringing Reggie Cannon on, I got a solid 20 minutes about the Jacob talking to him. All right. Before we get to Reggie, Chicago Fire, Kalen, you weren't around for that one, which was criminal. We went with, by by vote, popular vote, Cuadro did I make? Did I make it? Or no, I didn't. You had I some shout outs. You, up, you okay. were my first lock. I get observation deck, nothing. I mean, what no. Is so when actually, when people go up in the elevator into like some of the viewing points, they all have to wear the helmet you get just the, for safety. Uh, that was the headband era, though. That was a whole yeah, different, uh, that was a whole different fair. vibe. Yeah, you get you get the, the the official white Lamborghini of uh, for the Chicago Fire. Can I tell you a story of uh, white, white Lambos? Yeah, did yeah. I tell you that one? Sean, yes. Josh? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Different, different guy. Tell I it. don't know if he made the uh, the uh, Mount Rushmore, but he Neri Castillo, not. I believe he actually saw him up on some list for like biggest bus DP signing of all yeah. time. It might be Doyle's list. Yeah, yeah. we did that. I we think did that on the extra that, time. Okay, Twitter yeah. yeah. Herc, Herc Gomez, I saw, I think chose Neri. But Neri came in the locker room and he asked me one day after like a fitness session uh, how much it cost to get a white Lamborghini. Um <laughs> Oh no! He just said, "How much does a Lamborghini cost?" And I was like, "I haven't. I I still don't know how much a Lamborghini." Costs. You could tell me it was like eight hundred thousand, three hundred. I I hundred. I don't know how much it costs. I was like, I can. I had drive a nineteen. No, I had like a two thousand and one Acura that I bought with like ninety nine thousand miles on it. Um, <laughs> Got to get like, under hundred, man. Get yeah, under hundred. <laughs> right, right before I was like, I can tell you how much that costs. Or like, I know a Ford Focus. I know a lot of like different class of cars. But he was deciding whether he wanted to ship his over from Greece or buy a new one, and which one was going to be cheaper. So, Mark. which yeah. one did he go with? Um, I don't know. I don't know. He was around the team long enough to <laughs> ship it over. Um, <laughs> yeah. But anyways, the Lambo is still there. in transit, chasing wherever he is. Man, <laughs> just imagine though, summers in Chicago and your white Lambo. Yeah, mm, riding yeah. along the lake. That's good stuff. Well, literally, so. yeah. Sean Johnson's the other one who, who, but he got his for free. So well played by Sean. Well done, Sean. Yeah, Sean's not in it though. He played a ton of games for the Fire. We have Peter Novak to get us started. Chris Armas, C.J. Brown, which I was happy about, and then Quatermark Blanco. Agree? Yeah. Disagree? Did we nail this? Oh yeah, Did we agree on Quatermark Blanco. I thought we went with Zach Thornton. No, we didn't go on Zach Thornton. We put it to a, a vote, and they voted for Quatermark oh, Blanco. Do you remember this? Yeah. You suggested the vote, Dave. I didn't. I didn't check the polls. I've been, okay. you know, there's been primaries and ETR votes, so I, I was just a lot moving. I wasn't sure who won. Well, I tell you this: it it is hard to vote against uh, Zach Thornton, mainly because he's also on that feared list. <laughs> 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 and Zach was uh, when I was a rookie; he was like uh, you know one of my vets that looked after me uh, in a in a whole lot of different ways, and just an awesome. I mean, he is a, a face of the team, but I think it's hard. So, it, in some ways, because of his longevity and all that, it's hard for me to pick someone over Zach, but. When I think about Cuauhtémoc Blanco and how important he was um, for the fire in a different way, and I think Cuauhtémoc is actually underlooked as far as his um, impact on the league. I think he's one of the most impactful signings in MLS. And when we look, I think he was just a little bit ahead of his time as far as the English and Spanish uh, coverage at that point were two very separate worlds. And now you see these worlds co- 
uh, sort of colliding and combining it in, in ways alongside this more uh, collaboration between the two leagues, the star power that he had, the antics. I mean, he would go and like tell the referees, like make their glasses face at them. He was yelling at opposing coaches. He was scoring goals. He was the best player in the all-star games. Um, he was always up for the big show. And I know Doyle said, uh, you know, he didn't have the trophies or the hardware to show for it. I think that um, sadly was sort of due to some of the changes of that were just constantly happening around the club at the time um, that where I think we, if we could have held that group together a little bit longer, we were close and close and going to Eastern conference finals. And then things really kind of got shaken up uh, around right up, basically right when he left around 2009, 2010. Um, but yeah, he, he was a tremendous player. And when I think of the Mount Rushmore, I'm going to, uh, yeah, I, I think Quatamuk Blanco needs to be in that, in that list. I want to see him staring down on me. I want to see what that bust looks like. Of course, the fire, not MLS originals. FC Dallas, a.k.a. the Dallas Burn, were. Reggie Cannon's going to help us out with this Mount Rushmore. All right, let's turn our attention to FC Dallas and the Mount Rushmore. Joining us now, Reggie Cannon, straight out of his kitchen. What's up, Reggie? <laughs> What's up, guys? Glad to be here. What are you doing these days, man? How are you staying fit? How are you filling your time? I know I'm struggling with it. You staying positive? Yeah. Everything good on your end? Yeah, I'm staying really positive. Um, you know, like I said earlier, you know, I really thought that I would never get sick of video games. Um, but here <laughs> I am. Like, I, I really can't do it anymore. You know, I'm I'm staying fit, running two miles every day, pushing myself, ball work. Uh, you know, I'm working on things that you know I was weaker on during the season. Um, but, you know, obviously I'm just hoping for all this to blow over soon. What's the ball work? Is this like straight out of, you know, like my childhood <laughs> where I'm banging it against the garage door? Or like, exactly, where, where exactly what you imagine. It's just a ball on a wall. Um, and I actually talked to, to Greg the other day um, and he said he told me the things I needed to work on. And really all it involved was a ball on a wall. Um, you know, just working on my weak foot, working on my half turns, uh, things like that. And it's really simple, really easy. Who would have thought at this point in life that the men's national team head coach would be talking to players <laughs> being like, hey, man, right. head, head out to that garage and just right. start banging it against that right, wall. Right. <laughs> Love it. I mean, I got all the tools right here to become a national team player. Right? <laughs> yeah. wall. We'd be national <laughs> champs, man. We get Doyle on like Instagram Live. He can evaluate my half turns. He's a big <laughs> half turn guy. You got it. You got it. You got Reggie, it. proposition. If you're bored, twice a week you log on here, you host this show. And Weeby goes and trains to become a national team player. <laughs> Sounds good. Let's flop rolls. I think actually, I think I think Reggie's got a better chance of becoming like a top tier podcast host than Weeby does of ever yeah. playing a single second of <laughs> ever again. Anyway. Well, yeah, well, look, I have Ben Olsen. I have Ben Olsen's ankles. All right, like these things have been shredded so many times, I can barely walk. Uh, before we get into the Mount Rushmore, Ben's and got a little more to show for it, but yeah, sorry, yeah go ahead. Well, fine. <laughs> Fine. Fine. Okay. Before we get to Mount Rushmore, Reggie, there was a lot on your plate coming into this season. You know, you mentioned Greg, and if people aren't picking up on that, that's, of course, Greg Burhalter. You signed mm -hmm. a new contract. There were a lot of rumblings about what you were hoping to do this summer and where you were hoping to go. Uh, first, tell me why the new contract, why that was the right decision for you, and then kind of take us through where your mind's at as far as FC Dallas and perhaps a move at some point. Yeah, so you know, I'm pretty open um, about it. Um, you know, this this contract. Um, I actually talked to the media people and and everyone, and I, I wanted to let them like I wanted them to know that the reason for me signing this contract wasn't because I was planning to stay for five years. It was because was I wanted to set up um, a lot of personal details in there, and you know, it was really setting up for the summer transfer. Um, and you know, there was a percentage of the, the fee that would go to MLS and then, to, you know, there were so many things in there that really incentivized Dallas to sell me. Um, and you know, that was one of the biggest things, especially before all this COVID happened. Um, you know, this summer was going to be a huge, a huge opportunity, um, for me to go. And Dallas and I had a mutual agreement. Um, wasn't that, you know, I, I think I'm better or bigger than Dallas. You know, I just wanted to be the best I can be. And I still do. Um, I want to start in a world cup. Um, I want to be, you know, the best right back uh, this nation's ever seen. I want to be the best right back in the world one day. I have aspirations. I have dreams. And I know the only way to do that is push myself and make myself uncomfortable. And, you know, um, that was obviously a big thing going into the summer. But, you know, now I really don't know where that leaves us. I'm just going to focus on what's happening and, you know, just be present. 
Reggie, who approached this conversation first and how did it start? Because Dallas obviously wants to be this club that sells players, but Weston McKinney maybe didn't go the way they wanted. There's mm-hmm. rumblings about the way it happened with Kellen. Um, and you right. kind of seem to be the next guy. Was it them trying to get out ahead of this? Was it you and your agent? Um, yeah, it was really me because I wanted to to make a pathway for the kids coming up to the academy because everyone now, at least from the academy perspective, is saying, oh, well, look at Weston and look at Kellen. They went different ways and, you know, they didn't do things. The club didn't help them. But, you know, I want to make I wanted to make a pathway to that there could be a mutual agreement between the club and the player that it, the both parties' interests are, are, are important, that I have the interest to go to Europe and they have the interest to sell me and develop players, that they can say they developed a model from academy to first team uh, to national team to Europe. And I can say, look, I can say to all the young kids, look, there is a, there's trust in this. There, we're a family. Like you can trust these guys because there were a lot of bridges that were burned, especially with the, um, the whole Weston McKenney thing. And, you know, I, I look and looking back, Weston made the completely right decision because there were, there wasn't trust in that. There wasn't trust in that deal. Um, but I wanted to kind of make a bridge, make a pathway for these kids so that they have both options. So they can decide to go the Western route. They can go decide to go my route. Um, and hopefully this all carries through, but you know, I'm just trying to be present. How, how do you make Everything. a decision like that? Uh, so like in your case, how do you, how does one kid from the Academy, at least in Dallas decide, <laughs> Oh, maybe it's time for me to, how do you know when the time is right for you to try and take that next step? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, even when Dallas offered me when I was 17, uh, before I went to college, I went to college for three months and played there first because I knew I wasn't ready. You know, there, I think everyone has a different path. It's just about evaluating. Everyone wants to be, you know, the next Weston McKinney, the next Christian Pulisic, but there's steps that everyone has to take and there's a different path. Um, And for me, that was college. And then, you know, grinding for a year when I wasn't playing and having a dream, no one, no one would have thought I would have been on the national team or, you know, starting for FC Dallas, uh, the way I am now, uh, three years ago, you know, there, there's, there's levels to these things. I think it's, it's honestly just, you have to decide what your pathway is and decide what's the best for you. That pathway is so important. And, you know, with Dallas, they have figured that out in large part to help get kids in the first team. And then, you know, the hope is, as you're saying, to move on. I wonder when you think about the next step, what you think is important because to be the best right back in the world, that's lofty to play in a world cup that's yeah. achievable, but lofty, but you have to make the right, right decision on the next step. What does a club right. have to have, or what do you think they need to have to be the right situation for you? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this is a, this is a good question. I really think that, uh, you know, looking at the teams overseas that were, um, or are interested, you know, I think it's about finding out what, what's going to improve my strengths and my weaknesses <clears throat> to the utmost ability. Cause I see players like Sergio Des, I see players like DeAndre Yedlin and, you know, I'm thinking in my mind, like if I if I'm not playing to the best of my ability, if I'm not being uncomfortable and fighting for a position week in week out, I'm not going to beat those guys out. The, these are some of the best players in the pool, you know. And so I look at Serginho and, and Yedlin and you know uh, all these other players that you know this is an opportunity for me to challenge myself to be the best I can be because that's how competition grows and that's how this team is going to be great. If everyone's comfortable, it's just not going to work. Um, and so, you know, obviously I'm very close to Serginho and Yenlin, but I also look at them as people to motivate me to be the best I can be. Yeah, what did they tell you about what, their, their club situation? Ever... Sorry. Yeah, I... Go ahead with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Raise, raise the finger, Doyle, so we know. What's, uh, <laughs> what, do you, what do you see in their club situation? What do they tell you? Because you have to choose the right spot. What are the sort of attributes of a club that would be right for Reggie Cannon? Yeah, um, you know, I, I actually talked with Greg about this, talked with Yedlin about it. Um, you know, obviously everyone wants to play in the Premier League and everyone wants to play in Bundesliga. Um, but you know, I may not I may not be fully ready to go straight to Premier League. You know, there that's why we talked about an intermediate step with maybe a stepping stone club um for a year or play Champions League or something that you can get seen and have exposure. Um, you know, because talking to Yedlin, he he's told me and you know, I, I have the ability to play in the league he plays in. But again, there's there's levels. Yedlin's been playing in that league for so long. He has rhythm. He knows what it's like. He's played against Hazard. He's played against all these players. He knows what it's like. Um, and so for me, it's just about finding a club with attacking fullbacks um, and, you know, being able to do work on both sides of the ball because that's my strength, uh, to be a threat offensively and be solid defensively, to be, 
hopefully to try to be the complete package and, you know, um, talking, even talking with Greg about, it, you know, being, um, you know, stuck on a low, um, a low league team, not a low league team, but maybe 20th to 18th or something like that. It's kind of tough to play actual football. You know, it's, it's more just, you know, we're trying to get the do- job done and however it's going to get done, uh, we're going to do it. And maybe it doesn't have the style that may benefit me. So, you know, um, having these chats, is just good to just find the right, you know, find the right balance. This is fascinating stuff, I think, for our listeners and certainly for us to kind of get inside your brain here, Reggie. Last one, then we'll get to the history of Dallas and the Mount Rushmore that we're building, uh, along with your help here. This pandemic, coronavirus, I mean, this is definitely a, a blip that you could never have predicted. Right. Has it changed things? Has it has it made you a little nervous about what could happen in the summer? Or are you are you just trying to keep some perspective? Yeah, um, it, it really has um made me a little anxious to what's going to happen in the summer because, you know, looking at it now, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen with the transfer window. I don't know if those teams are still interested, you know, and teams aren't even taking calls right now because of everything going on, you know, and it's just kind of a time that I really just have to be present. Um, You know, I have to focus on making the people around me better in Dallas and being the best I can be. Um, And I know that opportunity is going to be there. Um, You know, if it doesn't happen in the summer, then hopefully it happens in the winter. But, you know, my focus right now is Dallas. Um, I'm I'm keen on giving everything there because I know if I if I do that, then, you know, I'll be the best I can be and eventually head over. Let's talk Dallas for a second. Obviously, you've been around a little while, but you still are (laughs) a young player. Before we get into who's on your Mount Rushmore, we were curious coming up through the academy, the way the club is built. And you talked a little bit about what you want to do as a first team player all the way down. How much is it talked about? past players, past glories, past issues, all of those things as you come through the academy. Is that part of that training? Yeah, you know, even, um, you know, talking with guys that maybe were before my time, um, like I remember talking with uh, Fafo Call about uh, David Ferreira. Um, he said he's never seen someone like that run the league so smoothly, you know, and that kind of helped me influence my decision on who's on my Mount Rushmore, um, you know, because I had I was debating between the, the fourth and final spot um, and so you guys will hear that soon, but, um, there's a lot of history, especially that goes into Dallas. Um, and there were so many good players I wrestled with this, uh, last night. So, um, it's going to be an interesting topic. I can't wait. Reggie doing right, the dude. research. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just wants to be a world. He wants, he wants to be the best podcaster in the world. That's all. <laughs> on his way. You're on your all way. Right, man. Who's the I mean, This show is the Real Madrid of yeah. podcasts. Oh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So Marcelo, who's on your Mount Rushmore for FC Dallas? (laughs) Okay, here we go. Um, First and foremost, I think one was undeniable for me, and that's uh, Jason Christ. Um, I think he took the team um, to new levels, MLS MVP. He was the first one to really be that that guy, that high-level guy that would perform week in, week out. Um, Next one, maybe a bit of bias here, but Matt Hedges, um, just because of his – consistency his loyalty and his leadership how long he's he's been at Dallas and what he's accomplished I think he you know especially on my debut you know he he gave me the confidence to to kind of grow throughout that whole season he was helping me because he you know he he believed in me you know he was the guy next to me he always made sure he had my back um and then the third one uh, this is where things get uh, a little tough um I chose I chose Oscar Pereja again a little bias. Um, but this was a reason for, you know, I think he, not only from a player's perspective, but he, uh, he also built the pipeline for the Academy. He, he helped give me an opportunity and made a model for, for kids like me to follow with Kellen Acosta, with all those players that helped me kind of show me the pathway, um, kind of helped me become a pro. So I think, you know, from a coaching standpoint, from a model standpoint, he's got to be there from a player standpoint, again, an unbelievable player, solid player, um, someone you could always trust. And for the last one, this was the toss up. Um, it was between David Ferreira and uh, Bobby Ryan. And the reason for that is because the influence Bobby Ryan had on the club was unbelievable. Like they, it, it, it changed the landscape. And hearing the stories from Fafa about David Ferreira, about how smoothly he ran the league, how there was no one in the league doing what he was at the time. You know, I, it was before my time. So, you know, hearing these stories, it kind of influenced me to put him on my Mount Rushmore. Um, you know, that was that, that, that really influenced me. So Fafa, I give you a shout out, but those are my four. 
Wait, so Fafa Pico and not Jesus Ferreira convince you to get Bobby <laughs> Ferreira on this? Jesus, Jesus doesn't like talk. He, he doesn't really talk about it that much. It's it's surprising, you know. Um, you know, he talks about his, his dad sometimes, but he never really talks about him back in the day. It's really players that were, you know, on the older side that uh, really helped put things in perspective. I know Joel's a UConn guy. <laughs> I think Reggie what, you what you were saying about Bobby Ryan. How how did you feel his presence within that club? We all know the story, the yeah. tragedy, and mm-hmm. sort of where the, the place he occupies in club history. But how did you feel that as a player coming up through and a fan before that? Yeah, I mean, even playing in the invitationals and you know all those tournaments where I didn't really know the history and hearing hearing about it from uh, the club, hearing about it from the owners, it really impacts me because it shows that the club, what the club was like before him and after him, because the impact he had. And even then, you know, looking at um, Paxson taking over the number um, for him, that that was like, you know, again when I signed, I didn't quite know what that was, and then you know, Paxson, you know, having that responsibility and that role of taking on the um, the role of Bobby Ryan was huge. That was uh, hu- very impactful. It meant a lot to the fans. It meant a lot to the club. And that's uh, that's an example of, you know, the impact Bobby Ryan had. So, you know, to me, that was a hard decision. But ultimately, I went with uh, David Ferreira. Ready, Joel, you want to make your Mauro Diaz case here? Because I, <laughs> I know you're sitting there. Yeah, I got you're sitting well, there thinking. <laughs> I mean, first of all, like, there is no bad choice, right? Davi Ferreira right. was a big MVP in 2010. And he was, right, right. Um, you know, the best team on that team. That, uh, the best player on the team that that went to MLS Cup, Bobby mm-hmm. Ryan, a legend. I, I was fortunate enough to go to college with Bobby. I knew him pretty well, okay. and it was it just it hurt to lose him um, mm-hmm. for for the entire MLS community. My pitch for Mauro Diaz, even though he was, and, and I'm sure you know this better than all of us, completely mercurial on the field and uh, maybe even more so off the field. Uh, yeah. But the best Dallas team of all time is still the 2016 team. Won the Shield and the U.S. Open Cup double, um, mm-hmm. and I think had a really good chance to be the first U.S. domestic, first domestic treble, U.S. or Canada. Of course, Toronto mm-hmm. did it the following year. Nobody from the U.S. has done that, uh, but he did his ACL in the final game. He was yeah. the best player on that team. Mauro yeah. Diaz was the best player on that team. He was best 11 that year uh, among the league leaders in assists, as he was every year in terms of per mm-hmm. 90. Um but what really pushes him over the top for me is the 2016 U.S. Open Cup final. That was Dallas's first final since the 2010 uh, mm-hmm. MLS Cup. And uh, at that point, Dallas had only ever won one major title. I have to go yeah. all the way back to 1997 with Jason Crisis team. Mm-hmm. And Dallas went down. Dallas actually yeah. went down to the Revs in that game, came back and won 4-2. Mauro Diaz had a goal and three assists. I have watched. I have watched more MLS, I think, than any human on this planet. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of Cup final performances uh, during the MLS era, so going back to '96, we're talking MLS Cup, U.S. Open Cup, Canadian Championship. Mauro Diaz in the 2016 U.S. Open Cup final is the single best performance I have seen over mm-hmm. the past quarter century. And it was with Dallas's first piece of hardware in 20 years on the line. Mm-hmm. So I think just from what he did for mm-hmm. that season for the best team, there has to be room for Moro Diaz on the Mount Rushmore. Yeah. I understand that argument completely. Um, and I can confidently say anytime someone asks me who the best player you played with, I always – Moro Diaz is near the top of that list every single time, one or two, always. Yeah. Because I'm training with him, he was a different beast. Like I couldn't couldn't take the ball from him. And I remember I was training with the first team at 16 years old. And mm-hmm. I was literally I couldn't like, you know, I was going one v one on the wing against Fabian Castillo. You know, <laughs> I thought I thought my career was over at 16 years old when I was in high school because I couldn't take the ball from him. And then I went to, I went I found a different beast. I went Mara Diaz. You know, I was obviously a kid. Like they put me in any position possible. And when I was like playing six, defending this guy. I couldn't even touch the freaking ball. I couldn't do anything. I felt like I was looking around. I couldn't find it. It was unbelievable. Um, but the the thing is, like, the impact he had is, uh, like, it's undeniable. But for, I think it's more about the history and the legacy for me. And when Mauro Diaz's career is officially over, I, I have no doubt uh, he, he he can be easily put on that Mount Rushmore. Um but I, I think he's still 
you know, I know he's still doing um, doing stuff, you know, because he left us in uh, – it was two years ago. It's a yep. Shabab Ali FC, you know. It, yeah. You know, and he – you know, it was kind of blowing to now uh, halfway through the season. Um, but I think when his career is said and done, people are going to look back and say, yeah, he's on the Mount Rushmore. And I, I honestly agree with that argument completely. Yeah. I want to so know what it was like. We gotta expand Mount Rushmore then. That's what. Yeah. <laughs> we've, got eight places up there. we've got the observation deck. We'll find a place for all these guys. <laughs> I wanted to close you out on this one, Reggie. You talked at the beginning about your contract situation, your future, what you want to do. In thinking about this Mount Rushmore and about legacy and history in a club, how does that affect the way you think about your career? How does that affect the way you talk about it? with your teammates, you know, one of the things we talk about in all of these is longevity, you know, loyalty, all these things, but also wanting to be the best player you want to be. How do you juggle those things? Yeah. Um, you know, cause it's hard because my loyalty and is with FC Dallas and you know, th this is the club I grew up playing for in this club. I would love to keep playing for, but you know, I want to be uncomfortable. I want to be the best I can be. And learning the history of, you know, David Ferreira, Mar, uh, Mara Diaz, all these guys, uh, Jason Kreis, who's my Olympic coach. And I promise you, I'm not just gassing him up so I get a spot on the Olympic squad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but learning about all these guys, it's it's impactful because it shows how, how much the game has grown and how, you know, because back in the day I didn't watch soccer. I didn't understand it as much. And now seeing the, the statistics and watching them play um, against, you know, just as good competition because a lot of people have the, you know, that, Oh, soccer, you know, if Jason, if someone played in this league today, they was, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of arguments about that, but seeing the, the history of it makes me want to be the best I could be to, to help lift those guys to to be the best I can be to go to Europe to start in the World Cup to win an Open Cup to to win an international trophy it, it inspires me to be the best I can be um, and hopefully breed more competition that people are watching this or seeing me and want to come take my spot um, because the way this works is competition breeds greatness um, so you know I just really want to be the best I can be watch out for Reggie Canham both on the field and in the podcasting space, man. Good my Rushmore. Appreciate all your research. We'll try to find a way to narrow it down to four. Good luck with that wall, getting those touches in, the half turns and everything uh, with your dreams and aspirations. Thanks for joining us, man. Thanks, Take guys. Care, Reggie. Hey, hey, Reggie. Thank you. All right, man. We got Reggie Cannon's Mount Rushmore. He doesn't have Mauro Diaz. He doesn't have Bobby Ryan, who's in mine. He has David Ferreira, which fair play to him. Although Fafa Pico, was Fafa even around when – David Ferreira was He's a soccer doing fan, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> he was up in NYC like me watching FC Dallas games on Thursday night MLS with Taylor <laughs> Twelman and Saturday night FSC games. Dude, FSC. That's a test. If you come up to some, like an MLS fan, you're like FSC and they don't know what that is. Man, New arrivals. Max Bredos was tweeting about it the other day. He used to do Argentina games by himself in a closet on Sunday afternoons. <laughs> and they were the peak of soccer in my life. <laughs> And just just to, just to correct you, David, uh, Twelman was not the national broadcaster mm -mm. for MLS games at that time. I think Who was, that was the John, Thursday night games? It was John Harks. John Harks, yeah. Yeah. Should have put that in the trivia on EDR yeah. Trivia tonight. What a it's okay, David. Up. Hold your mouth about that. Who's it going to be? We're I'm not putting leave. this one to a vote. I refuse to put another one to a vote this early back-to-back. -back. I think you're, you're real safe just to get it rolling with Wait. Christ – Hedges and Pereja. I think that's those are a safe. So I disagree. Lots. I think what you do is you transition Pereja to coach and you take him off the Mount Rushmore as a player, and it gives I, you the space to add the guys who deserve it. I'm good with that. I'm okay. good with that. I, I'm yeah. fine with that logic too. So let's take him off. Let's say it's Christ and Hedges. Hedges yeah. like leads in yeah. basically every single category as far as games played. The loyalty, as Reggie said, he's been there forever. He's the captain through their some of their best Defensive teams, player if not of the their year, best, team. best yeah. eleven. Defender yeah. the yeah, so uh so that was an be... easy one. I think number three is Bobby Ryan. Uh, I agree. So my my issue with the Mount Rushmore stuff, like like again, this is no disrespect to, to Bobby Ryan, who was a very good player, but like it's supposed to be for the best players. It's supposed to be for the guys who were the ones who won you the trophies. No, but we've made decisions that is, that is more than that too. We've said, I I understand, and I've disagreed with those decisions. <laughs> okay. <so laughs> so, you... so I said, like Bobby Ryan is on the Mount Rushmore of UConn men's soccer. Yeah, and but he's on the Mount Rushmore of human beings who have ever been involved in MLS. But I just, 
And I understand why. Uh, but anyway. But, but you can hear from Reggie Mara. even. But you can hear from about- Reggie even talking about the impact that he felt as a young player in the club. And and that that's not only because of his play on the field. It, mm-hmm. It's because of, uh, you know, his role in the community and 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 what he means as a club. And that carries on to Paxton Pomichol and all these other young players as well, too. So, I mean, for me, I think it's a really compelling case to put him on that Mount Rushmore um, for the club. And, and you, when you hear it from the players there and the ownership and, and the staff and people around that club and you go to Dallas and you walk through those halls and you see his presence there, it, do, it does feel like he would be an important person to put on, on that Rushmore. The other thing about it, Doyle, is I understand your argument. It would be easier if either of the other guys, which I think are Mauro Diaz and Far- Ferreira, had done it just for a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. Two years is such a short time. Like when you look at Mauro, really at his peak at Dallas was two two seasons. And it's not always his fault, injuries, stuff like that. But that's such a small time period to say, you know, for Javinko and Bradley, it was this long for Clint even it was longer at Seattle like the conversations we've had I don't know that that because it was so short it makes it hard to say this trumps this because they were an elite player but also for an elite amount of time where Mm -hmm. I get that they were the part of the best teams in the club history but we're talking about one two years with both of them Mm -hmm. to me it's most important players yeah I didn't put him on mine to me, is most important players, and, and legacy is a part of that. So I think we have three that are going Bobby Ryan here. So okay. Bobby, push him onto the Mount Rushmore, and that leaves one spot between Mauro and David Ferreira. By the Ooh. way, Bobby Ryan, one of three players in the club history to have 200-plus games played, along with Hedges and Kreiss. Yeah. So that's part of that legacy and that longevity. Who would be that fourth then? Battle Royale. You got an MVP, and you got the best player on the best team in club history. I would go I'd Ferreira. Go for Go, yeah. oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I think it has to be Juan Telha. I think if you're thinking about this, honestly, you got to put the, you got to put Led Zeppelin in. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Kaylin, you were going to talk about actual soccer. Uh, no, I don't know. Now you got me thinking of my favorite players. I mean, Kenny Kenny Cooper's up there. Jeff Cunningham, other FC Dallas guys. That um, Kaylin, what year were you drafted? Two thousand six. So like right when they moved in. That was like that good three year span when they moved yeah, into Carlos the Ruiz. Yeah, Carlos Ruiz. Yeah, I I played. I think opening day for MLS, um, in it was on ABC 2006. My first ever MLS game was against FC Dallas, yes. and it was the Brimstone Cup. Was the uh, <laughs> was the rivalry between Section Eight and the supporters of FC Dallas? So, uh, yeah, didn't didn't make the Heineken rivalry week cut. Uh, things have changed <laughs> rapidly as most all rivalries have in MLS, but. Um, yeah, at the time that that was a, a real thing. Um, but I, I think that when I remember that period of time and I, I also saw Mauro Diaz play and um, he was fantastic and you just could never get the ball off him. But I, I just remember David Ferreira and um, when I when I watched them play he and when we played against them, he was always the best player on the pitch. Um, so dangerous. Scored goals, created assists. He he had so many different parts to his game, and I don't know. I just I, I think that's where my vote is going. I think he was M- MVP, was he not in two thousand nine, two thousand ten, two thousand ten? Okay, so yeah, I, I just I, that the year I he, he took them to MLS Cup and scored in MLS Cup. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I think that for me pushes him over the end, uh, over the edge as great as Diaz was. And some of this may come down to like, yeah, whether you're a supporter shield uh, truther or whether you're an MLS cup guy. And uh, I think I've made my side clear in that camp. Although I've won well, neither of them. Didn't win. MLS cup. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, it's tough. I think David Ferreira, you also have, it's not a demerit on him at all, but the injury for him, uh-huh. Yeah, but it's I mean, the same that, for that, Marrow. Yeah, I mean, that, that deprived us of just, like, the best player in the league at that time for an extended period. And Marrow was the exact same way. So they both have sort of these, like, little things that knock them down. But And, and maybe it's nostalgia factor for me, or maybe I just don't have the same sort of, like, deep-seated love that you have, Doyle, obviously. But I think, for me, it's David Ferreira, and it's probably just because of that's when I was really, really getting into the league in a hardcore way. And so he was one of the first guys that I could really latch onto and admire and say, oh, my God, th- I get to watch this guy in my league every single week. And I, I just – I felt like – I don't know. I felt like maybe he he meant a little bit more to that team 
than Morrow did. And not because Morrow wasn't great, not because Morrow didn't run the show, but because he also had Fabian Castillo and he had Blas Perez and he had do some we, other big names. Do we not remember? Do we not remember what happened to FC Dallas in 2017 without Morrow Diaz? Like the one bad year for the past eight years happened when Mauro Diaz did his ACL and he wasn't really himself again until the start of 2018. And he came back in 800 minutes in 2018. He had two goals and eight assists. He was averaging an assist every hundred minutes. And then, know, they, then they got rich selling him, which they were able to reinvent. I, I just don't like D- Davi Ferreira was great. He really was. I don't think he was the MVP that year. I don't think he was one of the five best players in the league really, but he, he was, he was legitimately great. Um, Mauro Diaz, the way he conducted a game, I, I like. I just don't even think it's it's that close. And the, then you add the fact that he was the best player on the best team in the league in 2016, and the best team in FC Dallas history, and the only team still in MLS history to have 60 plus points in back to back seasons. And then he had that performance. In the 2016 U.S. Open Cup final, which I'll say it again, the best single per- cup final performance we have seen in the MLS era, in any let's, cup final. Let's put like, it on the remix. I want to. We see should. That. I don't we should. Think I saw that. And the the amount of pressure on that FC Dallas team because they had been just beaten out by the Red Bulls the season before for the Supporter Shield because they hadn't won the MLS Cup when Davi Ferrer was there in 2010 because they didn't have a title a major trophy of any sort sorry no disrespect to the Brimstone Cup for two decades the amount of pressure on that team was huge and in that moment they go down I think two nil to the Revs. And it's Mauro Diaz who steps up and just annihilates that New England team in a way that Robbie King didn't annihilate them, in a way that Landon Donovan didn't annihilate them. He just absolutely hammered them in the moment when they needed that performance and that trophy. Mauro Diaz delivered in a way that no player has delivered in the 24, 25 seasons of MLS. Mm. That's my stump when, speech. Part two. So Love right now the, we're at two to one. Yeah. For Love it when the Ferreira. fire is in his eyes, man. Also, yeah. one note on that too. They won the shield, and remember they won it, and Mara was hurt, and they like came to his house and brought it to him. Yeah, because he had that's just done his he, ACL. Yeah, yeah. That's how much he meant to that team. The David, you're going to break this. You're going to break this yeah. tie, by the way. The other note is he was a true number ten at a time when MLS had moved into the high press era, and the game had sped up, and he was still able to do what he did. I'm doing this one because I think it's right. And two, just so that Doyle can hammer you guys with this for the rest of his life. I'm going to vote for Mara Diaz on this one. And wait, I have, okay, you're a good man, David. And I have one more <laughs> thing that I know will flip Weeby's vote. The goal that basically clinched the 2016 Supporter Shield for FC Dallas was scored by oh, Pescadito. Man. Pescadito himself. It was his final MLS goal. Oh my goal. God! Yes, he came back for that suit. He yes. like barely. Yes. Yes, and who had the assist? Mm. Moro Put Diaz it on a plate. Moro Diaz had the assist. Andrew, come on, change your vote. You know it should be Moro Diaz on so Mount Rushmore. Fish on a plate with plantains. I can't do right it. I, I still, I'm, I'm still on the Ferreira side personally, but because of your stump speech, because of Dave's decision here, we're going to give it to Mauro Diaz. Well, FC Dallas fans yell at us. Uh, Mauro Diaz is our fourth, and nine, nine, and the 2016 team is by far the best team in FC Dallas history. Give them that title. They go right into our best team of all time bracket, which we'll figure out at the end of this whole Mount Rushmore debate. Uh, let's uh, let's talk about a team that has a little bit less history. That's Orlando City. This is hard. This is hard. There's one name that's for sure. Don't even question it. Put put Kaka on there, and and you know probably four Kakas, and you're probably good. You have other candidates here. You got Dom Dwyer, uh, Scott yeah. Sutter, woo, Jonathan Spector, the first captain, I believe, or the second captain. Kevin Molino, hot boy. He's a legend down there, both USL and MLS days. Kyle Laren. Probably has a great shout here, even though it ended acrimoniously. And I guess you throw Nani on just for recency, but to me, he doesn't have a shot. I mean, I guess he does have a shot. Literally, anybody has a shot here. But uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with my top two. Yep. 
unprecedented because of situations. I think we're all learning to adapt to situations right now in the world. One, Kaká, because of all the things you said, and he actually is like top five in appearances because the team can't keep anyone around. And two, I'm going to go with the wall. <laughs> They've stuck behind this team. That's they were every other club has copied their setup now <laughs> and built one that's built a stadium. They were the best difference maker for that team. The first year was open. So there you go, Orlando City. Two, you could just build a wall right there on Mount Rushmore and throw Kaka's head on the top. So it's you're saying it's a wall, and behind that wall, someday we'll carve some more faces, but for now, nobody deserves it. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Pretty much. <laughs> That's what do you think? <laughs> I honestly can't argue that much it's with that. To be Otherwise, honest, you're talking to me about Christian Higuita, probably Adam Grinwitz, who's played six games in his entire career, <laughs> but got them to the furthest they've gotten in any competition. And maybe if you twisted my arm, I'd say Yoshi Yotun because I like the way he plays, but has like 20 appearances. I don't know what to say about this one, to be honest. This one's Galen? tough. This yeah. one's tough. I'll, I'll make the case for Christian Higuita. The, the most remarkable stat in MLS history, uh, Christian Higuita was an original Orlando City player. He was the last original Orlando City player. And as of uh, June of last year, and, and shout out to Alex Brown, who's at Alex Brown Swag on Twitter, uh, for doing crunching the, number, the numbers on this. Over the course of... Uh, their history, and this should surprise no one, um, Orlando City have a negative goal differential. They're, they were negative 69 as of last summer. Nice. Um, overall, uh, with Christian Higuita on the field, they actually have a positive goal differential. Christian Higuita is the only player in Orlando City history who actually has like that measurable positive effect. They were plus five which is not great, but, you know, for Orlando City, pretty good. Uh, they were plus five in his appearances and his minutes when he was on the field over the course of those five years, uh, minus 69 otherwise when he was not on the field. So I think oh. because of that, Christian Higuita deserves a spot on the wall. Okay, I'm good with that. I'd like to make the case for uh, Dom Dwyer. Um, I think it, when you look at his career and he started off, you know, in Sporting Kansas City, and I remember playing against him in a reserve game and uh, getting to know Dom a little bit, but it really was him going down to on loan to Orlando City to begin his career in the USL and scored a ton of goals in uh, in the USL for Orlando City, then comes back to Sporting Kansas City, goes on to win the title then comes back to start this new club. And yes, it's been some, it's been a lot of highs. There's been some lows. It's been all over the place, but I think due to his longevity coming in and being a, the top goal scorer for the USL side, then coming back and, uh, and scoring goals again in Orlando city, I think he's a super recognizable figure around town um, and in the community, of course, um, alongside with his uh, relationship with the women's side, which I think is a big part of the culture of that club. I think Dom Dwyer uh, in uh, in a relatively young club, I think he, he should be on the Mount Rushmore. I think this is like a Christian Ramirez sort of situation with Minnesota, where you're almost, because he did, did it on both sides, yeah. on the lower division side as well as the MLS side and what they mean to sort of the fan base in the city, you push him up there. You know, like Ramirez might not have... I mean, um, honestly, he might just be on by the MLS standards for Minnesota as well. But I think Kevin Molino then would fall into that category too. Yeah. So then do you make Kevin Molino also that player for Orlando City, a guy who won championships for this club? It was kind of this, it was the same club. It was the same club. They got pushed up and did well in their best season, which was their first season. They're going to be a 16 seed in our bracket. Come on, don't, Dave, stop shaking your head. Hot boy, have some love for the man. No, I agree. But well, we've already spent three weeks saying Seattle Sounders NASL doesn't count. San Jose Earthquakes. Well, it's because Seattle Sounders count. NASL couldn't play in MLS. Understood, but we're only talking about major league soccer production for these players. And if you're doing that, Dom Dwyer and Kevin Molino cannot should yeah. not get on this list. Uh, but the Sounders are so different, right? Because we're going back to like the 70s before they came to MLS. And they've also gone on and become a, a dynasty of sorts in MLS. So there's plenty of options there. We're, 
you were advocating making a wall up there. So <laughs> now we can't stretch the truth a little bit. Let's like open the aperture a little bit and recognize we need to, we actually need to try and figure this out so we can actually put some faces up on the wall. 43 <laughs> goals, six assists in 6,500 minutes. Four. Kyle Laren. Didn't yeah, make look, it I easy know, for I know himself. It didn't end well. That one did not end well at all. <laughs> we got paid. It didn't continue well, and then it didn't end well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like disappointment is the uh, disappointment is the name of the game with Orlando City. But like he produced, he was he was a big story for that team and for the league and for Canada. He's been much better than Dom Dwyer has been. You know, if he like, comes back to Orlando. I say uh, okay. that that would be that would be pretty cool to see. But Doyle's just used to great athletes from UConn letting him down off the field, but hey. still overlooking it for the athletic. Response. You know what? We're about to do a show where maybe two UConn guys get into Mount Rushmore. So I'm pretty I'm pretty good <laughs> yeah. with that. Actually. Okay, so Weeby, where are we at right now? We're at Kaka. I think I'll. Ex- I think the Krishna Gita shout, even though he couldn't, like the last couple of coaches didn't rate him as much as the first couple did. I think he goes on just on the, the goal differential because this this club has very little to hang their hat on as far as first team results in Major League Soccer. So have those two guys there. And then I think you got to go Brian Rochez. I think, you know, you. I'm sorry, I couldn't what, help myself. Do, Dwyer? <laughs> my Dwyer case wasn't? No, I'm you know? just kidding. Brian Rochez is not on the... I Mount think they Rush actually made money off Rochez. Brian Rochez. Yeah, that, he actually, you know... Orlando he play, wasn't he right scores in Portugal. Him. Yeah, it wasn't the right place for him. Let's yeah. just put it that way. I like the Dom Dwyer shout. I think the Kevin Molino shout is in the same sort of zone, but Dom is still there, so he could build on his legacy. So I accept that. Chris Miller? Spectre was a captain, but he wasn't around long enough, and now he's in Atlanta, I think. So I don't think you can give you, – you can't put that guy up there if he's in Atlanta with your arch rivals. Julio Baptista oh. scored one goal in MLS. Do people like <laughs> is Chris Mueller? Is he is he Chris Mueller, kind of like a like a Julian Gressel type character for the club? It, it hasn't been as long. I think Chris Mueller, Seba Mendez, and maybe Tesho are your safe bets for they could grow into it. Okay. So you could take the risk now <laughs> and see if your investment pays off down the road. Man, this feels like Do Vancouver. We go- trying Molino or Hot Boy. Point. Or sorry, Molina. That's where I would go. Nice. Kevin Molino or Kyle Laren? Because I'll I'll give you Dom Dwyer for perhaps down the line. And we probably what we do here is we carve Kaka in stone, and then everybody else we kind of carve them in soap, and we can just wash it all down in like <laughs> five ten years. It's like you just do a terrible job. Like they don't yeah, even just, look like the people. Go Cristiano Ronaldo on that thing. Just <laughs> yeah. Just have them begging to have their face taken off Mount Rushmore when the time comes. Yeah. Who's it going to be? I'll give you Dom. So we have three. Igita, Kaka, and Dom. Who's the fourth? Is it Kyle? Can we take it to a vote? Let's get Orlando fans. And this feels like a good chance for them to get, to get <laughs> this, involved. This one I'll open up. I didn't want to do I'd, it. Joseph Anders, Martinez? Anders says no. Just put Laren on. He's in the chat right now. Producing so, Anders. So a lot of fans did say Kyle Laren, like yeah. on our Twitter feed and, and responding to it and chatting with each other. Uh, the other one that got mentioned is Nani a bunch. I don't know how. But I guess because of the situation. Uh, no, so I refuse. Yeah. I won't allow it. No. Uh, I'm gonna say Kevin Molino. All right. Uh, who you got? I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. Laren. Doyle. Laren. He- I'm. I'm gonna go Laren too. You know I love Hot Boy, but it. You know. Yeah. I, the fact that he's at another. He's doing it in a, another club right now. Kyle like, Aaron plays for another team. Yeah, but he's not in MLS. Like he's not in MLS. If they paid him more, he would still be. Yeah, but he's not. He's not. And Kyle Aaron was awesome in Orlando. Like it, it, it's been a little while, and Orlando suffered a lot um, since then. But he was that he was scoring goals. The way he played, like playing with Kaká when Kaká was healthy, like that was uh, he was a real bright spot. Um, and so I, I think. Of uh, number one draft pick, I believe was he yeah. not Doyle? Yeah, yeah, number one draft yeah, pick. Was... He was a big deal there. So and and I mean, I'm holding out hope maybe he comes back to MLS someday. I, and Orlando would first, be awesome spot. First three years, 17 goals, 14 goals, 12 goals led the team in all of those years. Kyle Aaron did. He's still the ultimate. the stats. He was yeah. literally the only player in Orlando City history. 
Kalen said it. He was awesome in Orlando. He is literally the only player in Orlando City you can in history you could say that about. <laughs> this is not a stats conversation. You don't go up on Mount Rushmore if one, the things you did at the club, and then two, you publicly forced the club to sell you with their back All against right, so the wall. I'm going to make an executive decision. We are stopping construction on Orlando City's yes. Mount Rushmore. We I'm are fine with that. it for five years. <laughs> I'm fine with that. We just ran. We just it's ran out of funds. Work. Yeah, we ran out of funds on this one. All right. Well, I think it's Laren. We'll throw it up. We'll let him debate it. Maybe hit a question mark. We'll we'll let Anders decide this one. Who's the best coach? It's Heath. It's got to be Heath because the best oh, team is Inchi. 2015. It's Inchi but for is, sure. But isn't Inchi going to be uh, Minnesota United's? Isn't he? There's literally no. Wow. Other He's going to be on two Mount Rushmores. He can't. He can't. That's the rule. MLS.com. <laughs> What a He's definitely on our Mount Rushmore, let's be honest. We should just do we should do Orlando City coach power rankings. Has like if there's an ETR Mount Rushmore and you have to pick a manager for it, it's it's he's clearly on ours. You yeah. guys, Oscar Pereja oh one and one in his two games. It's true. I think oh then Poppy would be on two. Um who was the coach before James O'Connor? Christ. Jason Christ. Oh, <laughs> James, James O'Connor is the coach then. Well, well it's, congratulations, it's James really O'Connor. Stupid. James really... O'Connor. I think I think we're going Adrian out Newell. and running training sessions in Orlando, being the pastiest human being on the planet. That type of of desire for the club <laughs> yes. gets him on the list. Did he win yes. the All Star game? Oh, I don't know. No, they drew or uh, lost. Uh, yeah, let me. I, we were, I was just watching Simeone the whole time. Yeah, this is this is honestly dragging. This Orlando conversation is dragging me down. I can't do it, Dave. <laughs> tell us. Tell us who we're doing uh, on Thursday. Who are the two teams? Uh, we go Sons of Ben, Philly, and then we keep it French because we had Fred today, so we go up north to Montreal. All right, Montreal. Going to get let another UConn we'll... guy on Philly, man. God, too much UConn. <laughs> too much UConn, too much Where Orlando did City. Bernier too much did he go to Syracuse? He did. He uh, did. Okay. He's, he's, the, he's the only person from Syracuse that I like. So. Okay. Shout out to FC Dallas legend Chris Bondi, who's also a UConn guy, but current head coach of Northeastern University men's soccer. And on that note, 401 206 0. Text us, please. Extra time at MLSsoccer.com. I hope you guys have a great week. Everybody listening, hope you have a great week as well. Thanks for hanging with us. We'll see you on Thursday, everybody. Bye, bye. Bye, bye.